Today's speaker is Professor Christopher Davis. He's Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Maryland College Park. He received a BA degree with honors in Natural Sciences from the University of Cambridge in 1965, an MA degree from the University of Cambridge in 1970, and a PhD degree in Physics from the University of Manchester in 1970. He has served as uh, a scientific consultant to several U.S. government agencies and industry, and is, is particularly germane for today's talk. He is a member of the IEEE Standards Coordinating Committee, which deals with RF exposure from wireless devices. But let me give you a little bit of background. What we're talking about today is really something that's had a long history. People have been worrying about what we call non-ionizing radiation since the microwave oven came along. And I actually got sucked into this field way back in 1977 because I had a graduate student who at the same time as being my graduate student was a very senior scientist at the FDA who was actually tasked to look into whether there was any health risk associated with non-ionizing radiation. So I've been peripherally involved with people being worried about microwaves, overhead power lines, and of course, for the last umpteen years, cell phones. So that's a little bit of the story. And it's a lot of fun being involved with this field. But I do this kind of as a hobby in a way. Because thank God, the US government is not really wasting money chasing after this thing. They keep thinking about doing it, but at the moment, they're not. But you have to keep your eye on what's happening. And I, I do a lot of more traditional research in other areas, but that's another story. So I'm going to talk about this issue that's still very much in the public mind. And everybody who does research has lots of colleagues that help them. And I've had a lot of collaboration recently on a very important experiment that we've done in this context of showing that there's nothing going on when you irradiate tissues or cell with very low levels of microwave radiation, but I'll come to that a little bit later. I'm particularly grateful to my colleague Quirino Balzano, who I've known for many, many years, used to be senior corporate vice president of Motorola. He headed up their entire research lab that had to keep tabs on the public pulse and concern about this kind of thing because it's potentially very expensive for the cell phone industry, if somebody gets the idea that these devices are risky and lawsuits start going through and people start wanting all kinds of things that cost money. So they had to keep their eye on it, even though the, the vast majority of scientists don't think there's any problem here. The fact that many people in the public think there's a problem stops this issue just going away. And people in industry, you know, we can always say people in industry are bad, but they're not all bad. They try to make something that's useful and sell it. And they have to be aware of these public perceptions because it can affect the market impact of their product. In fact, it's very interesting. When the first microwaves came out, people didn't want to buy them because they had this idea. These devices cook food with radiation. And it was only after the Food and Drug Administration started certifying microwave ovens to have less than a certain amount of leakage. But the public suddenly realized that these were accepted, regulated devices, and they didn't overexpose people. And the sales of microwave ovens took off. And I don't think you can find many people these days who worry about their microwave oven. OK, but that was just the beginning of where it all started. And of course, I'll also come to the point as I go through my talk that there are scientists out there who want to keep this issue alive because it means they can get more money for research. And I suppose, to some extent, I could even peripherally be blamed for this myself because some of the research that we've got most recently was from a program really in Europe where they're still more concerned about this issue than we are in this country. 
And they actually funded us through this United Kingdom Mobile Telecommunications and Health Research Program to do some fundamental experiments. I'm sure that some of the people in this program created it because they thought there was a problem. We're actually helping them to show there isn't a problem. But that still doesn't mean this whole issue's gone away. Okay? And of course, I love this quote. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, which some of you have probably seen before. And the key thing about this whole business is that it's extremely common in today society that people worry about things they shouldn't worry about and ignore things that are really dangerous. You know, so you shouldn't worry about these things, in my opinion. You know, flying by plane, being killed by a terrorist, the fields from high voltage power lines, using a microwave oven, nuclear plants, using a cell phone. But people worry about these like, like crazy. I don't know how many trillions of dollars we've spent chasing after a few terrorists. I think it got totally out of proportion, but that's just my personal opinion. And look at the things that we do all the time that are extremely dangerous. You know, I've probably taken my life in my hands driving over here to talk to you today. Because I think this number actually is actually down a bit. We're making a bit of an improvement in our, I think the latest number might have been under like 34,000 last year, but it's still a lot. And of course, this is still a current issue. This is where cell phones are dangerous, if you're using them when you're driving along. And of course, all the other things that we're all concerned with. You know, these are things we really should be concerned about. Now, it turns out that cell phones are regulated by the Federal Communications Commission. And there's a peripheral relationship between their regulation and at least a perception that you don't want to cook people with a microwave device. Because let's face it, you know, people have done this and it's not a good idea. If you put your cat in the microwave oven to dry it off, it's not going to do it any good. So too much microwaves heats you up. And as a matter of fact, the current safety standard for human exposure to a cell phone indirectly is all related to how much power you would need from the phone to heat you up. And the number that you're allowed to be exposed to is a cell phone's allowed to give a maximum of 1.6 watts per kilogram in any part of your body, averaged over one cubic centimeter. Now, this number has actually been set 50 times lower than the lowest level that's shown behavioral change in animals that are exposed in experiments. Not harm to the animals, it just makes them feel as if they're getting warm and they'll move somewhere to get out of the microwave field. So this is an incredibly safe standard. People who actually work on RF transmitting equipment and the like, they're allowed to be exposed at a little bit higher level because that's the difference between occupational exposure and you know, random public exposure where you don't have a choice. And of course, this is the issue. If you put a cell phone near your head, you do actually get some microwave energy deposited in the head. Nobody's denying that. But it's small. And there's been a huge amount of money spent modeling this to see just where the energy goes, how strong it is, and how much heating actually occurs. And these computations that people do are very, very complex. Because the trouble is, you can't actually take a head and stick a phone by the ear and stick probes inside somebody's brain to actually make the measurements. You have to do it indirectly. Even though one of our contributions to this field some years ago is we were measuring the properties of the head so people could do this modeling. But we didn't use humans' heads. We used pigs' heads. Because believe it or not, pigs are physiologically quite similar to humans. But believe you me, they have the thickest skulls you can possibly imagine if you want to get inside a pig's head. You know, talk about human skull being thick. Pigs have thick heads. But we use the tissues from these pigs to figure out what's going on. Okay? And this is the quantity that people use. If you go to the FCC website, you can actually find all the phones that are available commercially listed, and they'll tell you what this SAR value is. Some are higher than others, but they all have to be below the FCC mandated value. So here's quickly what I'm going to talk to you about. I'm going to talk about the overwhelming evidence to the contrary that there really are no health effects from cell phone exposure. 
People are even starting to worry about the base stations, which have such low fields, you can't imagine why everybody would be worried about them. And here's just a couple of relatively recent references that show that nobody's finding anything. Of course, occasionally, scientists are out there who do find something, or they claim to find something, but in a distinct minority. The problem is, as I'll talk to you later about, the media always pick up on these occasional positive findings and ignore the overwhelming preponderance of evidence to the contrary. Okay, So the primary reason why I think there is not an issue here is that if radio frequency radiation produces biological effects, there must be a mechanism for that to occur. It's not magic. Okay, So I'm going to talk a little bit about the ways it might interact with you. And then I'm going to talk about how much heating you actually get when you use a phone. And finally, I'll finish up with this experiment that we did lately. People had actually suggested that your brain is like a radio receiver. And it can demodulate the signal from a cell phone. That's what does the business to you. So we did an experiment to prove that that doesn't happen. But let's go through some background. I mean, this is a very busy sort of slide. But this is just examples of things from the media where people are claiming that they're seeing bad things caused by cell phones. You know, media reports exaggerate cell phone risks. You know, th there's even been people out there saying that cell phone use is more hazardous than smoking. I mean, this is so ridiculous. I'm surprised the media even bothered to publish something like that. Said, it's so crazy. OK? And, you know, they'll make statements that new research indicates there may be a health risk. This is where they're picking on the one experiment out of 100 where anything shows up. And that's the one that causes concern, even though a gazillion other experiments don't show a thing. This study, and believe it or not, a lot of this scary stuff's come out of Scandinavia. They're very concerned about public health. I, th I, th I could say they have a much more touchy-feely society than we do. And they have a tendency to worry about things too much. And they spend a lot of money chasing after specters. But that's the way they are, because they have a very social system of looking after people. And they worry about things they probably shouldn't worry about. On the other hand, they probably have better health care overall than we do. Okay? And so people do report weird effects. but. I really believe that they're in such a minority, and the, the, the evidence is that there really isn't anything there. But I have to acknowledge that these reports crop up from time to time, and that's what gets people's attention. You know, it's like Three Mile Island. You know, you'd have thought it would have killed thousands of people. I, I used to love that bumper stick, and maybe some of you saw it. It used to say, more people have been killed in Ted Kennedy's car than have been killed in nuclear accidents. <laughs> 